Okay, I hope you guys can hear me now. Uh, didn't notice that my audio is wrong there. I'm not sure what happened. Uh, let me check. Um, I think you guys are able to hear me now, but um, let, let me check for sure to, to make uh, everything set up. I hope also the audio quality is all right. Um, but yeah, sorry for that. I didn't didn't notice that. I I'm not hearing myself, so I didn't notice there was there was no audio. Um, so <laughs> let me introduce again for today's session. Um, I should have read uh, YouTube chat earlier. Um, so today's session is about isolated uh, pawns and basically in a couple. So I think yesterday uh, Sophie Hotel gave a session about. Um, uh, isolated pawns and an isolated pawn is uh, usually where one pawn is kind of backward um, I'll show you this kind of structure so let's say okay black doesn't give away the queen like this but uh, this kind of structure with only the d pawn is a structure with one isolated pawn but today we're gonna talk about a different kind of structure um, today we are going to be talking about um, isolated couple pawns. Um, so basically, two pawns that are isolated, and uh, two pawns that can become weak, but also can be an asset. Um, so what I was talking about while my mic was muted was that um, usually um, one of the two will be unprotected by or not protected by another pawn. So right now, both the c5 and the d5 pawn are not protected because you're missing the b and the e pawn. Um, one thing to also note is that black has um, one more pawn island than uh, white has. So if you count black as three pawn islands and white has only two. So uh, structurally speaking, usually um, these hanging pawns are not so great. And I think that's one of the reasons they, the structure is not so common anymore at the highest level. Um, because it's not a great structure, but uh, in some cases it, it's definitely fine and in some cases it can um, help you to try and outplay your opponent because they're a very dynamic structure. Um, it's the same with this isolated kind, uh, pawn structure. Um, Strategically speaking, you're not doing that great because of the isolated pawn, which means that you have to try and find very dynamic possibilities to play for, uh, or to play for, and um, this means that you uh, should not be trying to exchange minor pieces. Um, in general, you don't really want to exchange pieces, but um, the more pieces that are on the board. Uh, the more dynamic the position is. So one thing you should be trying to go for with black in this kind of position is not to exchange too many pieces. And as you can see in this position, for example, um, already two minor pieces have been traded, which really benefits uh, white because uh, the more pieces get exchanged, the less dynamic possibilities bl that black has, which eventually will lead to um, these hanging pawns getting weak and the moment they start to get weak they're going to be really really difficult to defend because um white will start putting pressure on them so um let's let's see a little bit how that can go um let's also see how these kind of positions can arise um so this was a game that rose from 1d4 usually these positions are from 1d4 openings so uh, let's get into it um it was um, a pretty solid opening for black um, but at some point you have to put the pawns in the center and black started doing this but um, what happened was that uh, eventually we got to this structure and black doesn't have the hanging pawns yet but as you will see in this position there's a lot of pressure on the c file and um, the problem is that the c6 pawn is kind of backward right now and black doesn't have a lot of space. Um, also, the c6 pawn is making the bishop on b7 uh, quite bad. So, um, black has to kind of go for the c5 break eventually anyway. And he goes through the structure and suddenly we have the hanging pawn structure. So, this can very, very often happen actually uh, from 1d4 openings. 
and um, yeah, it's something you kind of have to know about. For me, um, what happened when it was uh, not very common with 1d4 openings, when I was playing black, I was playing some kind of semi-slav uh, or slav or whatever. I wasn't really sure what I was doing against 1d4. And I would very, very often end up in this kind of position where I would have the worst pawn structure and I would have no idea what to do. And eventually, uh, I would just get a passive position, my pawns would get weak, and eventually I would lose the game. So I was really unhappy with what was going on in 1d4. And uh, you should quite often know how to deal with this kind of structure, um, to know when you should go for it, when you should not go for it. Um, sometimes you can get great positions as well, of course, with the isolated uh, couple pawn. Um, or the I, I'm probably gonna refer to them as hanging pawns from now on because that's the term I was very used to um, when learning about chess. So I'm gonna refer to them as hanging pawns. And with hanging pawns, you very uh, well need to know what to do with them, but also when to go for them. And here, um, it's definitely still okay for black, and that is because white's king is still in the center. So White's King in the center should still give him some possibilities for counterplay, but he has to act fast. And um, one variation in which uh, Black acts fast is, for example, if White plays the move Bishop to e2, um, unpinning the e-pawn, but it would still allow d4, um, opening up the center for Black. Um, e takes d4 would be a bad move because now the um, e fall gets opened up and after a move like rook to e8, uh, black is doing great. He sacrificed the d uh, pawn to get a lot of active play and with bishop a6 to come, um, black is simply doing great in this position. So black was already threatening to go for that d4 break. If he managed to get d4 in, then he's doing quite nicely. But one thing I would like to say as well is that you have to be a bit careful. Uh, one thing I stated at the start was that uh, both of them are not protected by pawns. Uh, and then it kind of makes sense to at some point push for either d4 or c4. But what happens when you, for example, push for c4 is that your d5 pawn uh, becomes backward and uh, can easily become weak. Also, you're giving up on the dark square. So if you push for c4, then all of these squares uh, will become weak. Where if you push for d4 at some point, okay, let's say it's in this position, uh, and let's not factor in the dynamic possibilities here, then you are weakening the light squares as well. So you have to be a bit careful with pushing either of the pawns because um, you may weaken a couple of squares. So one thing you would like to do is keep the pawns next to each other to keep all the, uh, the squares protected uh, for as long as possible. So you would like to keep the pawns on c5, d5 uh, as long as possible until you find the right moment to strike in the center and go for that push uh, with your d4 or c4 and gain the uh, advantage with some dynamic play. So in this position, uh, black is ready to go for d4. So uh, white in this position had to play something else. By the way, um, the white player in this position is Karpov and the black player is Korchnoi. So uh, two very, very strong players. And um, this was actually a mono game for Karpov, so White is going to win the game. And he showed how to play this kind of position. So the move White went for was a move Queen to H4. And one of the reasons is that you want to uh, be able to, or you want to exchange pieces uh, simply. So this move Queen to uh, H4 makes a lot of sense because you're um, right now it's threatening to exchange the Queens. It's not even so easy to take the Queen because after Queen takes, Knight takes, you can already see that the C5 pawn is getting weak. If C4, then um, the D4 square has been weakened and also eventually maybe this Bishop on B7 can become very, very bad because it's looking towards his own pawns and it doesn't really, it's really passive. So also not something you really want to do. So uh, in the game, black went f6, but it does weaken the king a little bit. Um, no, I, I'm not not using lipstick. <laughs> no, um, a bit of a weird question. Um, but black went f6, and the reason why the queen on h4 is also so great is because it's attacking the h7 pawn. So after the move bishop to d3, uh, basically comes with the tempo because white is kind of threatening checkmate 
and um, black needs to do, deal with this somehow as well and he goes g6 so black has just wasted two moves so white is able to develop with bishop to d3 and now black uh, white is able to get his king out of the center and has castle so uh, now d4 is way less strong of course because there is no pin on the e file anymore so black uh, finishes the development and now you can see already a bit that these pawns can become very weak and it's just in general quite difficult to find the right moment to push either c4 or d4 because d4 is, can just be lost pawn and uh, c4 will weaken the dark squares and making his own bishop quite bad so already things have gone wrong for black in this position and here uh, Carper played a nice move rook to e1 um, preventing any d4 because now in this position if you play d4 then e takes d4 comes with a tempo on the queen so the move really doesn't make sense um, so d4 has been stopped simply if in this position for example uh, white played a bit of a strange move like rook c2 then maybe d4 could have been played because after um, e takes d4 bishop takes f3 uh, g takes f3 the, the pawn structure has been ruined for white and maybe black can get some compensation for the sacrifice pawn here um, but in general also um, after the move c4 uh, white would like to get the bishop to this diagonal uh, not to e2 so I, I think also c4 would make some sense here so rook c2 wouldn't be so great but um, white simply stops the move d4 so now um, not really knowing what to do um, or how to like what to do with the pawns uh, Korchnoi pushed for c4 but it really weakened the, the dark squares and now for sure white has a very stable advantage because the pawns on the light squares, uh, the bishop on b7 is not great and uh, should be better for white. One reason why Korchnoi pushed for uh, c4 was that with the move rook to e1, Karpov was also ready to go for the e4 break. So let's say uh, black plays a waiting move like king to g7. Um, Karpov could have maybe gone e4. And the reason for this is that after the move d4, now the light squares have been really weakened and uh, the pawn on c5 is very backwards. So this would be a structure you would like to get with white. So e4 was kind of an idea for white. And another idea could have been to um, push your e4, d4 and then push your b4 trying to go after, trying to isolate the d4 pawn by going takes full by taking the d4 pawn. So some ideas for white and uh, Korchnoi really didn't want to allow this, so he went c4, but it's not really a move you want to make. Um, Karpov retreated the bishop to c2, knight c5 happened, and now you can see how uh, the dark squares have been really weakened because the queen just occupies the d4 square, and um, these pawns can become very weak very easily. Um, rook to d8 happened, bishop to b1, uh, rook to b1, I mean. Maybe again some uh, b3 or b4 ideas, but also in general, the b2 pawn can be a bit backward because of the c4 pawn stopping it. So eventually, maybe black will play some rook b8, move the bishop out, and then have some pressure along the b file. So the rook and b1 makes a lot of sense. Knight to e6 happened, uh, queen retreats, rook to c8, knight to d4, and um, now the pawns have been blocked. And usually what you want to do when um, your opponent is playing with either one or two isolated pawns is that you first want to block them and then start to attack them. So now um, White has fully blocked the pawns and what you will see happening is that at some point uh, White will simply start to uh, double on the d file, put pressure on the d5 pawn and uh, will just be a very very difficult position for black. So rook to d6 happened, uh, exchanging the knights, and now rook to d1. Um, already trying to put pressure on the d-file. Uh, rook to b6, trying to put pressure on the b-file. Rook to d4, f5, uh, rook to d1. And it's already a pretty difficult position for black, because right now there's not really a threat for white. But at some point you could imagine something happening like rook to d2, bishop to d1, bishop to f3. And at some point this pawn on d5 will be incredibly difficult to defend for black. So um, in general it's a very difficult position and um, 
course, Knight tried to do something active here, but it didn't really work out for him. Um, he went queen to f6. Uh, Karpov went h4, trying to get rid of any back rank uh, issue. So he always king h2. And also he's starting to go h5, trying to uh, gain some initiative on the king side. And Korchnoi really didn't know what to do in this position. And he kind of panicked, or I'm not sure how to explain it, but he went for something really drastic. He went for the move f4, and um, he sacrificed the pawn trying to get some play, but it didn't really uh, work out. Um, here, e takes f4 would have been great as well for uh, Karpov. Um, followed by some f5 at some point, uh, crushing the king side. Uh, also, h5 is coming, so this would have been also quite great. But he went for the endgame instead with rook takes, queen takes e3, b takes e3. And here, uh, white was simply up a pawn. Um, he does have the b file, but there's nothing much to do, as you can see in the game. Rook b8 happened, uh, h5, rook to b2, and Karpov simply defends. Um, after which, uh, basically, uh, Korchnoi doesn't really have compensation for the lost pawn. He'll eventually lose this endgame. So you can see how easily things can go wrong for black. Um, because the pawns are in general quite weak. And um, it's not really a pawn position if the pawns get blocked. Um, so I want to go to actually... Uh, another game to show also how black should be playing uh, what when you should be going for these hanging pawns and when it's playable and <laughs> It's quite funny, but I just realized that the game I wanted to go to is Korchnoi Karpov So the the players are reversed this time Korchnoi is white Karpov has black and Karpov beats Korchnoi with the hanging pawns um, so Karpov kind of showed uh, Korchnoi uh, both sides um, to yeah, Karpov showed Korchno from both sides how to play. And um, it's kind of a similar opening, actually, as the previous game. And again, it was again a 1d4 opening, and we again get this kind of structure. Um, but there is one very, very big difference, which is that all the minor pieces currently are um, still on the board. So what happens here is... Um, that um oh wait sorry for that didn't want to do that um so what happens here is that black simply has all the piece on the board which gives him a lot of uh piece play he he still has um he, he still has a lot of active play uh the pawns also are quite well protected as you can see here uh, the knight's protecting this one, the bishop is protecting that one, this knight is protecting this pawn, and the bishop is protecting the d5 pawn. Um, which ensures that the pawns are not that weak, um, because white's minor pieces aren't really attacking it also. I think white has a kind of a bad setup, because as you can see, okay, this bishop is putting some pressure on this diagonal, um, but uh, that's it. It's not putting pressure on the c5 pawn or on the d5 pawn. Um, this knight is nowhere near putting pressure on the center. This bishop is not putting any pressure on our center. All, only this knight is really putting pressure on the d5 pawn. So also here the pawns are not weak. And um, here it's ex it's very playable, this structure. And at some point black can aim to push for either the d4 break or the c4 break. Um, so white went queen to c2, slightly improving his position. Rook to c8 makes a lot of sense. Uh, supporting the c5 pawn. Also, at some point, you could, for example, see some d4 happening. e takes d4, c takes d4, after which the rook will be an open file. So, rook to c8 makes a lot of sense since this, the queen is also on that file. Rook to d1 happened. And um, w one thing Karpov would really like to achieve is to put this rook to d8, uh, supporting this d pawn as well, so that it will be more easy to play for d4. So, uh, Karpov's next move makes a lot of sense queen to d4. I'll reverse the board, by the way. Um, so we have a look from the black side, <laughs> have a look how it looks like from the hanging pawns. And um, the move queen to b6 makes it able for Karpov to play rook to d8 next, while also uh, targeting the d4 square. So the queen on b6 makes it also a bit more easy to go for the d4 push. Queen to b1 happened getting off the c file, uh, prepare or 
making it a bit more difficult for black to push through d4 because the knight will not be pinned anymore. So rook to d8 happened. And now uh, Korchenai tries to do the same plan as Karpov did. He tries to double on the d file, putting pressure on d5. So he goes rook to c2. And now um, it's not so easy yet for black to push. Um, c4 will again weaken the d4 square. So this would be a strategical mistake here, I think. Um, while d4 is just not really possible yet, d4 you can simply take that pawn. C takes d4 and then you take it again because it's just not well protected enough yet. So Karpov again improves his position slightly. He goes queen to e6, uh, securing this or protecting this bishop on e7, um, while which makes it able for the knight to jump to e4, to g4, to h5 because it's unpinned. Um, here, bishop to g3. Bishop to g3 happened because the bishop didn't really have much to do on the diagonal anymore. But I think this was a very bad mistake. I said before that uh, with black you shouldn't really be trying to exchange minor pieces. But uh, with the move knight h5, uh, black is able to win the bishop pair. So black kind of goes for the bishop pair. He does exchange one minor piece, but probably the bishop pair should be valued a bit higher than um, this minor issue of exchanging a minor piece so uh, black should definitely go for it with knight h5 because the bishop pair is in general quite nice to have so rook to d2 happened takes takes and knight to f6 and one advantage was also that the knight on d7 didn't really have a lot of great squares so by getting rid of the other knight he does gain the f6 knight for or the f6 square for the other knight queen to c2 happened and um yeah, um, basically what happens right now is that black is not really able to push for either d4 or c4. But um, white also doesn't really have any pressure on our center. So neither are the d5, c5 pawns weak, nor are they very strong currently, because they're not. you're not really ready to push yet. So what Karpov does is slightly improve his position with each move. He goes g6, uh, gaining a little bit of space on the king side. Uh, queen to a4 happened, a6, uh, because the a, a7 pawn was hanging in this position, so he protects it. Bishop to d3. And Korchan also didn't really know, knew what to do here, probably. Um, king to g7, uh, protecting the g6 pawn, because maybe at some point uh, white could go for some kind of sacrifices. So it's just it's a little bit of a safe move. Bishop to b1. And now queen to b6 went back. Um, and again, black is trying to go for the d4 push. So at this stage, um, both sides are kind of uh, trying to improve their pieces. And Korchno didn't really seem to pay a lot of attention to uh, what Karpov was doing. Because what was happening was that uh, secret or kind of secretly, um, Karpov was improving his pieces. So what was happening was that um uh by playing queen to b6 um he was able to go for the d4 push so and the reason for this is that the queen again uh helps uh protecting the square so white pushes for a3 and the reason for this is that by this with this maneuver bishop to d3 bishop to b1 he wanted to finally put pressure on karpov center but the problem for white is that um, d4 is just playable. I think uh, Korchner really underestimated that d, uh, or just completely missed that d4 was possible here. The, the thing is that it seems like the d4 square is protected so much. The e3 pawn is there, the knight's there, the rooks are both there, and the queen is there. But um, after it takes. Um, the move Korchino missed was bishop to c6, attacking the queen, so the queen has to go somewhere. But um, doesn't really have a great square, because if we let's say go to c2, um, black has this nice little in-between move, bishop takes f3, g takes f3, c takes d4. And now again you can see that this queen of c2 is just really really bad with this rook on c8, because after e takes d4, c takes d4, the knight gets pinned on c3. So probably... Um, Korchnoi misses bishop c6 in between move and 
um, is simply lost in this position. Instead, he went for the move knight to e2, but it's a really, really bad sign if you have to play this move. Because after d takes e3, f takes e3, uh, his, his pawn structure is just completely ruined. Um, now suddenly black is the one who has the better structure. Black is the one with the bishop pair. Black has so much going for him and basically the position is already lost for Korchnoi. Uh, c4 happened, uh, knight to d4, queen c7, and um, yeah, Karpov played a bit slowly, but uh, the problem was that his pawn structure was so weak that eventually um, Karpov was going to crash through, and after the move, queen takes g3, um, he's up a pawn, the king is still weak, and eventually, um, yeah, Karpov won the game. Um, because he, he was just up a pawn with a much much better position so this is also one thing uh, you can see is that um, because there was still so many uh, pieces on the board there was a very very dynamic position and um, for example the position in which he went d4 was very very dynamic as you could see in especially in this line with a takes d4 bishop to c6 uh, there were tactics there um, and um, it was a nice position for Karpov and he was just winning the game at this point. So also it's it can be a lot of fun to play this kind of position for black. Um, so let's go to another game in which white uh, was the one who was doing quite well to show again like how things can go wrong. It's, it's good to see from both sides really uh, how not to play and how to play, when to go for this structure, when not to go for this structure. When things have gone wrong in the opening, and um, in this uh, in the next game we're also gonna look at a bit of an old game, but a very very famous one. It was in a match between uh, Spassky and Fischer, a very very famous World Championship match. And um, what happened was that uh, Fischer always said uh, one b four uh, one e four is best by test. But for this game, he went for a bit of a different direction. I think it was the first, basically the first time ever that Fischer had played the move one to one c four, and um, what they got at some point was again this kind of position. They kind of transposed to some main lines via one c four, and um, again such a line in which at some point um, I think it was c takes the five here yeah c takes d5 happened e takes the uh, knight takes d5 bishop takes e7 queen e7 knight takes d5 e takes d5 and again we have this kind of structure uh let me flip the board by the way uh where um black kind of has the c uh, backward c pawn and one very very important thing to note is that two minor pieces have already been exchanged so if at some point black pushes for c5, we can again go for the structure. And um, it really benefits why that already two minor pieces have been exchanged. The thing is that it's still quite solid for black, but um, it's definitely a lot more easy to play for white if already a couple of pieces have been exchanged. So um, work to see one happened, putting pressure on the c-file. Uh, black had to first protect the d5 pawn before it could push uh, c5. Um, by the way, uh, we would almost transpose to this carp of course, a game that we just looked at after move bishop to b7, queen to a4, c5. I think it would be the exact same position as we had, but with it's with the pawn on h6, we would, which would definitely benefit black. Uh, I think, however, queen to a4 in this uh, exact position doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, Why well, should probably just play a move like bishop to d3? And after c5, you will simply take on c5, uh, take back, and then castle. And again, we have this uh, structure. Uh, two minor pieces have been exchanged, and what should be a bit better here. Um, instead, uh, Spassky put his bishop on e6. And now Fischer went for a very strange-looking move at first. Um, but we've already seen his idea in the Garp of Korshnoi game. Um, Fischer went for the move queen to a4. It seems a bit strange right now. Can White play something like knight for f4 followed by king f2 and then double up the rooks on h5 and start a kingside attack? Seems a bit slow. 
Um, yeah, that was about the previous game uh, that Eccentric Horse was talking about. Um, let's have a look again at that position in the previous game. Um, wait, let me find the game first. Um, so we, he was probably referring to this structure after h takes g3. Um, he was talking about some plan with knight h4, f4. But the thing is that e3 gets really weak. Um, okay, you can play king f2. But in general, e white is really exposing his own king. And also, general rule of thumb is that uh, it should be very difficult to go for the attack when both kings are on the same side. And the reason for that is if, if, you, if you start pushing your pawns uh, in front of your own king, also, not only will you go for the attack, but also your own king on g1 will become very weak. So it will not do a lot of good for white's own king safety if you go for such plans. And, um, and I think it's probably not a great idea for white to start to go for the attack and open up your own king. Because before you arrive on the king side, um, black can also open up with d4 and a good moment, open up the diagonals for the bishop pair and um, can become very, very difficult for white. So I think that's probably not a great idea. But let's go back to the Fisher game. Queen to a4 happened and in this position, um, Spassky went for the move c5, which makes a lot of sense because he wants to get rid of his backward pawn on c7, so he puts on c5 instead. Um, and the reason why uh, Fisher went to move queen to a4 was that so he is able to play the move queen to a3. We don't very often see this queen uh, landing on a3, but in a certain position, uh, it does first of all put the pawn on c5 under pressure, and second of all, uh, it also pins the c5 pawn because the queen on e7 is unprotected, so never you can play c4 here uh, because queen to e7. Um, because I think, for example, in this position, if white simply plays bishop to e2, not sure, I think something just went wrong. Okay, I think I'm live again, yeah. Um, let me check if everything is working. It suddenly said that my internet fully went out. Um, not sure exactly what happened. Uh, let me see if everything is working correctly. Um, yeah, it seems like it. Sorry for that. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, it seems like my internet connection suddenly uh, flew out. Not sure why that happened, but I think I'm back up. So um, the question here in this position was how should Y be playing? And the idea was, or the idea had to do with um, that black doesn't really want to push either C4 or D4. So the right move in this position is pushing for e4. Seems a bit strange at first, um, but the reason behind it is that black doesn't really want to go d4 because now he has weakened the light squares, uh, which is something I've said. So um, especially with the light square bishop still on the board, um, it's really a nice achievement for white that he forced black to push for d4. Um, needs to be said, of course, that the d4 pawn is a pass pawn, but the light squares are well protected so white has a very very nice blockade on these light squares which makes it very very difficult for black to even push the uh, pass pawn what if black took the pawn well if black did take the pawn then um simply the whole pawn structure would be ruined white black would have four um pawn islands and it's a very very bad, uh, bad pawn structure he's up a pawn for the moment but White simply doesn't care a lot, and um, four of Black's pawns are isolated as well. So it's a really, really bad pawn structure. So uh, Spassky in this game went for d4 instead. Now uh, Fischer pushed for f4, gaining more space. And one of the reasons was that he also wants to push for e5. So he puts this pawn on e6, where it will get weak at some point, because it's very easy to target uh, for Fischer with moves like these. So queen to e7 happened and uh, Fischer pushed for e5. Also never ever allowing black himself to push for e5. 
So um, it's a really nice achievement again that why Fisher has been able to push for e5 um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, Spasko went through b8. Fisher put his bishop on c4. And again, the queen is, has been on a3 for so long, but it's still very, very nice there. Uh, for example, one of the lines could be knight to b6, trying to exchange the bishop, because in this position, simply the bishop is so great. But, uh, for example, here, um, queen to c5 would be a very, a very nice move for white, uh, winning a pawn. Because after queen to c5, uh, white has a nice move, bishop takes e6. Uh, we check after King H8, you take the queen back and you're up two pawns. So, even though the queen in general shouldn't be so far from the center, uh, it's actually very, very nice in A3 where it puts pressure on black's position. I think Bishop E2 was the last position that I saw. How did we get to this position? Uh, maybe my internet connection went wrong there. I'm not sure. Maybe the stream got cut off. So how we got here, um, bishop to e2 happened, knight to d7, and Fisher went to knight to d4, trying to exchange a minor piece, queen to f8, uh, Fisher took the bishop, and then e4, and then we get to this position, uh, trying to force black to push for d4, so d4 happened, um, Fisher gained space with f4, e5, and um, I think at this point Spassky is already kind of busted. Uh, I think he's objectively already lost because a lot of has a uh, lot of things have gone wrong in this position. Bishop to c4, king to h8, uh, stopping any f5 ideas for the moment. Queen to h3 though, putting more pressure on e6. You don't really want to lose the e6 pawn, so he protects it with knight to f8, and now b3. Um, not only again helping out with a blockade on the light squares, trying to stop these pawns. But also, um, now there is no pressure anymore on the b-file. So it's a very nice position. And um, the next idea for Fisher in this position is to go for the f5 break. And eventually try and checkmate this king. Because uh, the king is a bit weak. It has been opened. Uh, the light squares are very, very weak. And especially if you have the light square bishop, it's easy to make, uh, to make use of those. So... Um, after a5, Fisher went for the f5 break. Pawn takes, the queen uh, rook takes, uh, trying to double on that f file with rook to f1 next. Um, knight h7, rook to f1, queen to d8, queen to g3, and uh, Fisher is uh, about to enter on f7, trying to checkmate on g7. Rook to e7, um, h4 first, stopping any knight g5 ideas. And black simply, it's its very nice, this h4 move. And the reason for that is that throughout the game, uh, Spassky hasn't been able to make one active move. He, he, he's, he, he's been stuck in this position with these hanging pawns that have gotten very, very weak. They've gotten blockaded. Um, and Spassky has made one active move in this uh, whole game. And he's, he's going to simply lose a very, very passive game. So rook to b7 happened, e6, uh, pushing the pass pawn, trying to go rook f7 next. Um, queen e5 first, a4. <laughs> there are a lot of ways to win this position, but a4 is such a, such a nice move because a4, okay, I'm not sure if even the move uh, a4 for black would have given him any play. But it's just such a nice move because it even stops Black's last slightly active move. Black is really not able to do anything here. And um, Fisher was just slightly, slightly improving his position with each move. And eventually he uh, managed to uh, crash through with his exchange sacrifice. But the king was already getting checkmated. And um, yeah, so at this point it was just resigns because h6 is about to drop. And uh, the king is just too exposed and is getting checkmated. And black really has made one active move throughout the game. So um, this is what can happen if things go wrong with these hanging pawns. Is that you can just end up in a very, very uh, passive position. And this is what would happen to me very often when I didn't understand the positions. Is the pawns get weak. Uh, you have no active pieces. And you can lose very easily. Um... So even to a former world champion, this happened 
and uh, you have to be very careful so let's have a, a look at one more game i think the last game we're going to look at for today in which um um uh, actually a friend of mine was playing with black and he got this uh hanging pawn structure as well and he was playing with them again we get this kind of 1d4 opening um so if you're interested in these hanging pawns um it's something for mainly your 1d4 repertoire or your 1d4 positions and it's for both sides you need to know how to play with them but also how to play uh, against them so let's have a look again at how to play against them i think in this game uh nice e3 happened bishop d4 kind of a nimzo variation um bishop d2 castles e3 bishop to b7 all very normal stuff and now we can already see this structure happening again. We get this c takes d5, e takes d5 structure. The c7 pawn is a bit backward. So in the future, black will probably go c5. And then d takes c5 will happen, b takes c5. And uh, the hanging pawn structure will arise again. So castles, uh, knight to d7, a3. Bishop drops back. Knight to b5, chasing the bishop again. So we move it. Um, rook to c1. And now black goes for a move c5. Because we want to get rid of this backward uh, pawn and there was some pressure on it. And one thing, uh, how to see that now actually the structure is quite decent and you can definitely play with it. Is we should simply count the minor pieces. All minor pieces are still on the board. So that's a very nice achievement. Uh, that's a good thing for black that all the minor pieces are still left. And one other thing is that uh, black white doesn't really have a great setup. In this position there are literally zero minor pieces that are putting any pressure on the black center um, while all of black's minor pieces are protecting it so um, they're for sure not weak these pawns because they're well protected and not really attacked so it's for sure a fine position right now uh, white played queen one which i think is a very bad sign it seems like a very strange move um, now Kaspar, uh, the black player, went for a bit of a strange move. Let's have a look actually from the black side for this game. So let's flip the board. Um, so wait, let me reach out again. Should Spassky perhaps have sacrificed the pawns and tried to play more aggressively instead? Well, the thing is that you don't really want to be down pawns as well. Um, it's not so easy to just give away the pawns. Um, I think it's simply that there were some minor improvements like black or spassky didn't really play that badly but what happened was he played some minor inaccuracies throughout the game and his position got very slightly worse and worse while fisher was basically playing the best move each single time and that's where yeah fisher just played better game than spassky uh, which is also where things went wrong so queen to b8 happened in this game and the reason for that is, as I said, usually in this structure, uh, the, there's some pressure for black on the b-file because this b-file is open. Uh, so queen b8 makes a lot of sense. He's also threatening some bishop a6 ideas, perhaps. Um, so there's a lot of pressure on the b-file. Bishop to a5 happened. And, uh, okay, white is simply threatening knight c7, uh, winning the exchange. So black's move makes uh, some sense. Rook to c8, guarding the c7 square. Queen to e2 happened, and now bishop to c6, opening up that uh, b file so that uh, black is able to press, uh, to put pressure on it. Um, knight to c3 happened, and you can see that this setup for white is really, really strange. This, I'm not really sure what this bishop is doing on a5. It seems very, very awkward on a5 to me. Uh, knight to e5 happened, knight takes, queen takes, and... Um, it seems a bit strange to exchange minor pieces, but uh, we saw this again as well in the Korchnoi Karpov game, the second game we had a look at today, um, where his knights will be on f6, d7, and because of that, this knight on d7 doesn't really have a lot of great squares, so it kind of makes sense to exchange one of them because both didn't really have a lot of active squares. And also by exchanging this minor piece on f3, um, we're getting rid of defenders of the king on g1. After knight takes e5, queen takes e5, they're really not 
any defenders on the king side helping out this king. While this bishop is already targeting the king side, uh, this bishop might be coming as well. So there's a lot of pressure on both diagonals. Maybe some knight to g4 soon. So it makes sense to get rid of this f3 knight, I would say. Bishop to b5 happened, tried to exchange minor pieces, but uh, black made a uh, good decision here not to do it. Bishop to b7, uh, not allowing another uh, minor piece to get traded. Uh, rook to d1 happened, and now bishop to d6 putting pressure on both diagonals and forcing this weakening of the king side. So we've already achieved a lot with black. Um, now, it's act now we don't really have the worst structure even because this e3 pawn is not only backwards but also weak because the white has gone f4. So we don't have the worst structure anymore and we have the more active pieces because these bishop on a5 and b5 are just very, very strange uh, to me. So rook d1 happened protecting the pawn Rook to b8, getting some play along the b-file, uh, queen to d2. And here I think uh, black played a bit of an inaccuracy. I think this was a great moment to push for c4. The reason for this is because the bishop on b5 is just very bad right now. And in general it's very difficult to set up a blockade on these squares. The reason for this is that the bishop on a5 is quite bad. If the bishop were on d4 or could be able to go to d4, it would be very nice. But the bishop is never really able to go to d4. The reason for this is that uh, the knight would at some point have to leave the c3 square. But then the knight can jump to e4, which is something black really does or white really doesn't want to allow. So I think c4 followed by bishop to c5, putting pressure on the e3 square followed by some bishop a8, putting pressure on the b-file, would be a nice move. Um, instead, black went bishop to c7, exchanging a minor piece. Uh, I think it's not a great idea, especially as the bishop on a5 is a bit strange. But it, um, I mean, nobody is a perfect right? So bishop c7 happened, uh, bishop takes, queen takes. Uh, black is, or white is kind of doing okay again. Probably is a bit worse, but definitely exchange helped white. So do not uh, exchange the minor pieces. Uh, if you're playing with the hanging pawns. H3 happened, rook to d8, and uh, because black is able to play rook d8 without the bishop on a5, it is, it is a lot more, or it's a lot more easy to go for this d4 break. Um, so queen f2 happened, preventing the d4 break for now, but now queen b6, uh, putting pressure not only on the b-file, but also helping out with the d4 break, because the queen does look towards uh, the d4 square. So bishop dropped back because black it, or white is simply not able to stop the d4 break anymore. So d4 happened, takes, takes, and uh, with this d4 break, um, black is opening up this diagonal. And also one very important thing is that the e3 square has been weakened because the opponents left the f2 square. So what we'll see happening at some point is that the knight will be able to jump to d5 and from d5 will be able to jump to e3. So very nicely played at this point for black, knight to b1, and now knight to d5, and um, basically white is getting crushed because the e3 square has been weakened. I think a lot of go uh, things gone have gone wrong when he went bishop to d3, I think it's a bit too passive, or the bishop is just kind of strange on this d3 square. I think it makes a lot more sense to go bishop f1, for example, to keep the rook, uh, or have, have a half open file for the rook. Um, so this happened, knight to d5, rook to c1, knight to e3, and um, the minor pieces that black has are just so much better than the minor pieces that white has, especially his knight on b1 is just very, very bad. Um, so g3 happened, and queen to b3, trying to enter on d5, trying to checkmate uh, the white king, something like this. So queen to d2, with the idea... I guess queen to d5. Uh, some what what did what did, ah queen h2. Okay, it's a bit strange what's going on here. What what is doing? But black simply plays bishop to a8, opening up that b file for the rook, trying to put pressure on the b2 pawn. Um, rook e2 defending the b2 pawn, but now um, a move like uh, queen to d5 would have been killing uh, because. After king h2, preventing queen h1, checkmate, queen h5 will simply lead to mate because knight g4 is about to happen. 
So Queen is, Queen D5 would have been an immediate killer. Black went for Rook C8. Eventually won the game because White's well, position is simply extremely bad. Um, but I think I'll finish the game here. And I'll draw some conclusions from today. So um, one very important thing for the hanging pawns is um, the minor pieces. So if you're playing with the hanging pawns, you should be trying to keep as many minor pieces on the board as possible. Um, to Because you have a worse pawn structure, you have um, white is strategically speaking doing very well. Which means that you have to play very dynamically. And to play uh, dynamically, you need to keep as many minor pieces on the board as possible. So if you're playing against the hanging pawns, you should be trying to go for the exchanges and eventually the pawns should be getting weak. Um, so that's one uh, very important point. Uh, one other point is that um, you need to time your breaks very well. So let's have a look at the structure again. For example, here, um, D4 is sometimes difficult to achieve with the E3 pawn. So D4 is very often a sacrifice. If it's not a sacrifice, then I would try to go for the d4 break. And uh, c4 break, um, it's not really a break because there is no pawn on b3. But you need to be very careful as well with the c4 break because you do weaken the dog squares. So uh, you need to time the breaks very well and keep the minor pieces on the board. And you should be doing fine in these structures from now on. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. There were some difficulties, technical difficulties. Uh, my Wi-Fi suddenly went out and my microphone uh, didn't work at the start. Uh, but I'll have that fixed for next week. I'll have my usual setup for next week. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's uh, lecture and uh, maybe, maybe see you next week uh, for a